from the campus studios of Sarland University, this is Ropecast, a lighthearted podcast for learners of English, with Roger Charlton and Peter Tisha. Hello listeners and welcome to another Ropecast, our podcast for learners of English, teachers of English, in fact anyone who's interested in English. And today again, welcome back Chris, who is Thank you. our technical expert but also a user of English in his own right. Yeah, and interested in what you told us last time about the leadership analysis of a certain professor. That's so. right. Um, I must admit, I came across his name and uh, what he's been doing quite by chance recently, a case of serendipity when I was looking at the way President Trump uses English. And uh, just by chance, I um, picked up an interview with Professor Stephen Reicher, who spent most of his academic career at St Andrews University in Scotland, but before that was in Bristol, and who more or less by chance came to study group behaviour. Now when you hear about groups, and um, in Bristol it was a case of what was called a riot, that is a large number of people who were moving through part of the city doing damage, attacking buildings and so on and so forth. So when people think of group behaviour, They tend to have rather negative ideas, don't they? Yeah. And Arisha got interested in this and found this is really only a small part of the picture. Mm -hmm. That groups behave as groups in certain fairly predictable ways, but they should not and cannot be described only with ne negative terms. It's probably just that we don't get the headlines if groups do something that is not in, in line with these prejudices. Yeah, well, when you think about it... Um, Important reforms of all kinds have very often come out of group behavior rather than the actions of individuals. Mm. They may start with an individual, but you need a group in order to achieve something. And uh, whatever you look at, you find no one person really ever makes... <coughs> the end of nuclear power in Germany comes to mind. Well, yes. <laughs> okay. It's easy enough to find examples wherever you live in the world, I think. Mm. So what interested me is... How does the work done by Steve Reicher apply to President Trump or to candidate Trump, who then managed to get himself elected to the position of President of the United States, which was not anticipated? So-called experts really didn't think it would happen. Mm -hmm. And yet he managed to persuade enough people to vote his way to achieve his aim. I mean, in my mind, there's always a difference between a leader, for example, in a business that Trump certainly is, and the political leader. But apparently the lines are not quite as clear. No, and in fact we could even extend this to teachers who are leaders, if you want, to have groups who are learners. Mm -hmm. That would take us in a different direction. Well, another point to maybe get back to at some point. Okay, yes. So what, um, based on the work of Reicher, what uh, we can say is in order to become a leader, you need to have a group. So it's very much a matter of creating or using something called group identity. Mm -hmm. So Reicher describes leaders as entrepreneurs of identity. I see. So that they're, they're basic um, building blocks, if you like, to achieve what they want, are how do you create identity. And that goes together with politics. I exactly, mean. yes. So leaders are always leaders of a social group social group in the widest sense of the word. Mm -hmm. And the essential thing they have to do is to create what he calls consonance between themselves and the group. Mm -hmm. The leader and the group have to somehow feel that they are in it for the same aims. But if you can persuade a group that you are with them, and you're going to help them to achieve their aim, then you are a leader. That's, and, that's the essence of it. And looking at the word consonance, it seems to me as if it also creates a dissonance at some point that can also be used. That's it. If you are going to be a group, then you are not an outsider. Mm -hmm. So there are the two sides. It's also a matter of what is often called othering. Mm -hmm. you know, Them are, and us. We, we are together and the rest are other, are mm -hmm. different, are alien, foreign, not us. So that, those are the two sides of it, yes. Now, what Trump was able to do was to persuade a large number of electors in the United States, that he was one of them. Here he is, a wealthy businessman, one who has achieved fame, success in business, on television, a big name, Trump Tower, 
one of the, I think it's supposed to be the tallest concrete building in the United States, isn't it? Wow, I didn't know. I think they claim that anyway. Mm -hmm. So there's a well-known person, and he managed to persuade many ordinary Americans that he was one of them. So now, well, the American dream, maybe. That's, that's it, the, yes. the point yeah. where he... Exactly that, yes. So one of the things he was able to use was the U.S. at the moment is in what many commentators call an anti-political age, or Americans would say anti-political age. That is, ordinary voters think those people in Washington don't represent us. They're an elite. They're not like us. They, mm. They're in it for themselves. They're not doing anything for us. Trump was able to use that and say, hey, I'm one of you. Let's, let's um, drain the swamp, is mm -hmm. one of the phrases Strong he Strong parallels to what we have in Europe as well. Okay, yes, you can now see parallels all around the world, in fact, in many different countries. So Trump managed to get them to see him as, as they say, the boy from the wrong side of the tracks, mm -hmm. who made good, who achieved the American dream, and you can all do the same thing if you vote for me. That's that's the big trick. Yeah, well, and I think works. you can see that um, the people who elected him are, by and large, still with him. Uh, however little he's managed to achieve, if he doesn't achieve his aims, of course, other people are to blame. So his mm -hmm. followers, his supporters, are, are more still, or less still with him. Still consonant. Yeah. And I think if we look at the language again, which we've been studying in the utterances of Trump and, its tweet and his tweets, he, for example, uses a great many colloquialisms. Mm -hmm. He's not averse to using vulgar language, like in the famous case where he was overheard and recorded using something pretty vulgar mm -hmm. before he became president, and it wasn't held against him by his supporters. He's breaking the, the linguistic rules of good behavior as well as breaking the rules of politics. Mm -hmm. And far from his supporters leaving him for that, they think, yeah, he's one of us. He's, he's one of the boys. He's a, he's a guy we can vote for. So the way he uses English, whether he studied it, I doubt, or intuitively, is actually quite skillful mm -hmm. in helping to create this group feeling. Despite so, his lack of voc vocab, as you well, yeah, that means found in the... If you take the average user of English and the average everyday situation, we don't use very varied language. Mm -hmm. We don't use much vocabulary. Everyday language. That's it. Yeah, that's, exactly. that's what makes him part of the crowd then. So the way he uses um, language, even in his State of the Union address, is here and now. He's inviting people to see, look, I've invited people along here. These are just ordinary Joes from American society. They're like one of us, and yet they've achieved wonderful things. And we want to build on this. All of us, all of us, little people, we can do things together. So basically establishing the link he has with his group by showing that others like him are also, they are linking up to the average populace. That's exactly it, yes. Uh, really, really ingenious yes, in indeed. a certain way. I think that, that casual comment just now about um, teachers also being leaders, perhaps we should follow that up sometime soon. Definitely. So we'll make it four then. Okay. <laughs> That's all for today, folks. See you then. Bye. You've been listening to Ropecast. Brought to you by Saarland University, featuring Roger Charlton and Peter Tischer. Tune in for the next edifying episode on your podcast dial.